pray. Father, we are so thankful for the Spirit of God who moves amongst us. And as we know Christ, the Spirit of God dwells us so that we can live a holy and pleasing life, being directed by the Word of God, directed by the Spirit of God, so that we can be light in the darkness. Father, whether our heart is weary or heavy today, we just, or whether we're glad and we're encouraged, we can come to you. And Father, we just thank, are so thankful for just your blessings in each of our lives. We pray, Father, for two. There are those that have family needs. There are children that need a touch from you or others in, a, in, a, in families that just need a touch from you today. And so, Father, we bring our, our petitions, our cares, our requests to you today, knowing that you will carry them and that you will answer in your time and in your way. Uh, bless us, Lord, as we look at your word today. We thank you for your grace to us all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A few of you have been wondering about this dog that we have in our family now. Uh, her name is Chloe. That's a beautiful picture of her at eight weeks of age. Now, from time to time, I have people, as I'm walking her, ask me what kind of dog she is. And I finally found out what breed she is. She is a golden border lab. Now, I'm trying to get this dog placed in the American Kennel Club. Her mother is a golden retriever mix. They're not really sure where her father was, um, but he is a farm dog somewhere up near, where did we get this dog? Wallenstein. So he's a Wallensteinian of some kind. But having dogs for a lot of time, I realize that she's got some border collie in her. Definitely. She has some lab in her because there are a few holes in our back garden. And she is very energetic. It was easy to house train, but now we're trying to train her off our patio table in the backyard. But one thing I know about this dog is that she is growing. You'll see a picture near the end of the message how big she is now. But one of the things that we wanted to do this summer as Pastor Jason and I were praying and, and just a series of messages, we wanted to talk about growth. Because the Lord wants us to grow and mature in our life. Uh, growth is really important. We are not to kind of stay the way we are uh, because none of us is perfect. We all have kind of issues and things and growth issues in our life that we have to face. And as a result of that, we have been looking at, we're going to be looking at a series of messages that will clear, clearly outline some topics and things to help us grow in our walk with God and our walk with each other. I'd like you to turn your Bibles, first of all, to 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. The context of this is really the last years of King Asa in Judah. He is up against the Basha king of Israel, and there are some things here, and this verse is quoted a lot. 2 Chronicles 16.9, it you know, says, For the eyes of the Lord reigns throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. And we kind of leave it there. And we take this verse, but we don't read the rest. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on you'll be at war. So what happens in this context is, uh, Hanani, the seer, or the prophet, comes to Asa in verse 7, king of Judah, and says to him, Because you've relied on the king of Aram, and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. We're not the Cushites and Libyans, a mighty army with great numbers, chariots and horsemen. Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord reigns throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You've done a foolish thing, and from now on you'll be at war. And he was to the end of his life. Asa was angry with the seer because of this. 
He was so enraged that he put him in prison. And at that time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. The events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though he, this disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Then in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and wrestled with his father. When I rediscovered that particular verse and read the context around it, it was not only an encouragement to me that the Lord wants to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. In, in fact, the, the New King James says to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. I like that rendering. Because when we're fully committed to the Lord in our life, He brings strength to us and shows us His strength. And people see it. No matter what we're going through. If we're truly trusting the Lord, we see and know God's strength in our life, no matter what we're going through. See, God partners with us to grow us and be healthy so that we can be healthy in every area of our life. Now, as a pastor, these next few things are very important for you to understand and for me to understand as well because... There are basically have been four models of how people grow within the church and as Christians. I want to say that each one of them is important. And there are different times that God uses these different models in our life. Okay? And I even added a fifth model. Okay? But in isolation, uh, they can be models that hold people or hinder people from growing because they really need another model to deal with the stuff they need to deal with. So I want you to understand that right up front. So these four models are laid out in Henry Cloud and John Townsend's book, How People Grow. The first one is the sin model. We, we tend to understand that. And that all problems are a result of one's sin. That's the, the main thrust of this. And so we hear messages that God is holy, God is good, you are sinful, you're bad, and the answer is, stop it. Right? And there are times where we need to hear this in our life. Uh, the key word is repentance. You know, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. Uh, from that time on, it says in Matthew 4, 17, that Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Even at our Easter play, Blair was running around as John the Baptist there saying, repent, right? He did a good job doing that. Every time I see him now, I want to repent. <laughs> right? And, and we need that model because we are sinful and we need the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have to move from there too because there's also the truth model. And there are those that, that, that are strong proponents of this. But like I said before, we need all of these models to understand kind of a, a holistic view of how we grow and well, how we deal with problems. So the truth model is that all problems are solved by truth. So the belief is this. Memorize more scripture, learn more verses, more doctrine, and think the truth to gain emotional health. Now there's an incredible truth in that. I mean, I've met lots of people who know the Word of God backwards and forwards, and yet they're not living for Jesus Christ. So the truth model has its limitations as well. And the key thing is that the truth will set you free. I mean, the Bible says this. The truth will set you free. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what Jesus says in John 8, 32. In Galatians 5, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and then do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5, 1. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then Paul says in Ephesians 4, 23, we are to be made new in the attitude of our minds. Do we need the truth model? Yes, we do. 
we need God's truth in our life. Because as, as we understand God's truth and hear from God, it's not just good enough to kind of memorize it, kind of get it in your head. Because we know the Bible also says that knowledge puffs up. But we have to do something with the knowledge. We have to obey it. Because even demons and the devil know the truth of God. And so we do need it. But the key thing is obeying it. Then there's the ex experiential model. All problems are solved by dealing with past hurts. There are times in our life where we have to deal with our past hurts. A lot of Christian counseling is like this. But it's one model of growth. Okay? It can't solve all of our problems. It basically says find the abuse or the hurt and somehow get it out. Just clear the pain. Take it to Jesus or take Jesus to the pain. I mean, the key thing here is forgiveness, right? But I've met many people who have been dealing with their past for many years and yet have not moved from there. They haven't forgiven. They haven't moved on in their, uh, in, with things with God. And, and they continue to kind of wallow in the past. And I see it time and time again. I've seen it as people continue just to grow bitter and angry at God and others. And yet, they can identify their hurts really easily back here and what's happened in their life. But they haven't gone to Jesus in such a way where He causes them to forgive. And notice this, what the Word of God says. I mean, Peter talks about the forgiveness we need in Acts 2.38. But Paul also says in, in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. There's some things in my past that I had to get over. And, and that particular verse helped me a lot to understand something. All the sins that I have committed in my life are greater than the ones that people have done against me in the past. And that was a breakthrough for me. Of these things that people had done to me in the past that were very hurtful. Realizing that Jesus Christ forgave me so much more because of what I did. And as a result of that, there, there was a lifting of some things. Yes, we have to deal with those things. Then there's the supernatural model. All problems are solved by healing and deliverance by the Holy Spirit. I, I've seen this model at work. I've seen the previous models work as well as we talk with people and help people in their discipleship. Right? Uh, healing and deliverance and the power of the exchanged life through the Holy Spirit will change us. And it's really the key is the power of the Spirit filled life. Paul says... Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery or a wasted life. He says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. And that's putting on the Spirit by faith every day and, and, and allowing the Spirit of God to indwell us and empower us. That's key to our Christian life as well. It's putting on the full armor of God because we are in a spiritual battle, whether you want to believe it or not. And as a result of the Spirit's work, one of the things that happens is that we see the development of, of the fruit of the Spirit in our life in Galatians chapter 5. So part of the evidence of the Spirit filled life is the fruit of the Spirit coming alive and growing within our life. Do we need the supernatural model in our life? Yes, we do. But, but I've seen many people abuse that because they say, well, you don't have enough faith or you're not doing this right. Or you must experience the Spirit the way I have experienced the Spirit. In fact, you might need to have this particular spiritual gift. And yet that goes against Scripture because everyone has a spiritual gift. We don't have all the same spiritual gift that marks us as the Spirit of God. And so we're going to be looking at some subjects around that uh, this summer as well. And then the last one that I included, I think this is an important one in our day. We, we see this in the life of Asa, don't we? I mean, what was his problem? Asa's problem. Was it his sore feet? Was it his sore feet? 
No. His problem was with God. Right? He went to all the physicians. He tried to get all the answers he could. He was trying to use what I would call the medical model. That all problems are solved by professional medical practices. Or all problems are solved by exercise, a good diet, supplements, and the right medicine. Okay? So I've met a lot of people. Ministered to a lot of people. Okay? They've been labeled by the medical profession or whatever. And they go, Robin, I'm on all the medication that you could ever want, and yet it's not helping. <coughs> because like Asa, we've forgotten to go back to God. Now I'm very thankful for the medical community. In fact, this past week, uh, one and I had to miss uh, the uh, agape meeting on Thursday because our son Justin had, we, we finally got him into this eye specialist in London. And, and, and so we went in the morning and he was in tests after tests and exam after exam from basically 9 o'clock until 1 o'clock on Thursday. Because our doctor was concerned about something, which I'm so glad about. And at the end, we were glad to hear he wouldn't need any more surgery because he's had two eye surgeries on each eye uh, before he came into our family. And that just some corrective lenses and some things will, will, will help. And in that, I'm going, I'm so thankful for the medical model of solving some problems. We prayed over him too. We've done all of that. But sometimes you just got to go to the right place to get the right answer. <clears throat> but I've met too many people who have a lot of different things going on. And the thing that we found out was, much like Asa, they have not gone to God. And when people go to God, too, for healing and deliverance, there is something that, that powerfully happens. And sometimes it's sin in their life. Asa's case, there was sin. He needed the sin model to be encouraged in his life. He needed the truth model in his life. He needed the experiential model because there were some things in the past that he had to get right with God that he was denying. And he needed the supernatural model, but he was denying it because he thought that he could handle it himself. Here's what we need to understand. And throughout Scripture we see this. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought with Christ. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Do you think God takes seriously our bodily health? Yes, He does. He does. And, 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 you know, I've heard people say to me, well, you know what, if I follow this particular model, this diet, it's going to extend my life. Right? No, it might, ex might give you good health. But there's a verse in Scripture that really kind of trips that one up. Because there's a belief out there today that people are going to just live forever without God. If they just have a good diet. And you know what? I have buried and had funerals for elite athletes to big fat people. Okay? And there's a verse that I, I can't get away from. Right? In fact, it encourages me to live each day honoring the Lord because I don't know when the end comes for me. But I do know this. And in Job 14.5, I think I threw it up there. It says a person's days are determined. And Job is saying this to God. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. Okay? So there are beliefs out there. You can go online, you can see it, right? Where basically if you take this stuff, and it's usually some sort of snake oil or something, you know, it's not really been researched or anything like that. It's just like take this, this piece of wood, this piece of dirt, right? And, you know, the guy who's pushing it out, you know, has doesn't have really a doctor or anything, research or anything. They're just saying stuff. 
because it worked for him. But eating a piece of wood for some of us would kill us. Right? Doesn't help us. Right? And there's some reasons for this that I want to get into very quickly this morning. See, we can't solve spiritual or soul issues through medical means. You can only use spiritual means through Jesus Christ to solve some of the issues of our life. In fact, most of the issues of our life. There is legitimate mental illness and chemical imbalances and all of those kinds of things that are to do with our physiological makeup. But so many people, and even in the educational system, get labeled that they miss out on the greater power and deliverance and growth that Jesus Christ can do in someone's life. So we have to be careful and discerning. So why do we all hit a ceiling or a lid of growth? I've had them. Where I've kind of just hit the ceiling, right? Hit the lid. And I've needed others around me to kind of lift the lid in my life to help me grow. Because spiritual growth issues are not dependent on just kind of growing or counseling issues or relational issues or medical issues. Spiritual growth it, it should impact all of our relationship problems, our emotional problems, and all the problems in our life. Because that's how God designed us first. You grow healthier by growing spiritually mature. And the spiritual and the practical are linked. The listening and obeying the Lord. Going to the doctor. If we have a bone sticking out of our arm, it's time to go and get it set. Get some surgery, right? Yeah, you can pray about it, but you might wait a long time before it gets put back in. That's why God gave us great doctors and great people like that. So there are some history of growth issues I want to look at very quickly. Three acts that you need to understand, okay? The first one is this, about creation. We need to go back there. We need to understand some things. I think Asa forgot all of those things. He for forgot that God is the source. Right? God is our source. Genesis 1.1. Right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then God created relationships. Right? In fact, he says in Genesis 2.18... That it, everything was good... But the, the thing that was not good... That man was alone... And, and as a result of that, he created Eve and families and, and marriages and, and friendships and congregations and all those things because we desperately need relationship in our life. We were created for relationship. But often what happens is that we forget that God is the boss. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, we, we see God speaking to Adam and Eve. You can enjoy the garden and everything there, but this one tree, don't touch it, please. Why? Because he's the boss. He knows. Right? And God's role is clearly set up in Genesis as well. He's the source. He's the provider. He's the one to be in control. Yes, he is the one to be in control of your life and mine. That's how he designed us. So that we could have a proper life. And our role is to be dependent upon him. Yielded and responsible. Living responsibly. Yes, we have great freedom in Jesus Christ. But great freedom means we live a responsible life before God. God makes the rules. And as a result of that, we have to listen and obey. Asa did not want to listen to God. And then we experience this other three, the second act of, of the growth issues is the fall, Genesis 3. And we see what happens when Adam and Eve sin against God. We see the brokenness there. We see all that happens there and God slaughters an animal and, and, and sheds blood and covers over their sin and their shame. God provides again for them and then that is the, the picture as, as we heard last week uh, of, of God pushing on His whole plan for redemption. And then we see the redemption of the rescue. We see God predicting the Messiah in Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, where we see very clearly the Messiah take upon all of our sin. We see in Matthew 6, 33, that we are to, to be people that, as a result of knowing Jesus Christ, we are pursuing the kingdom of God. And then you see kind of the, the main thrust 
That's all through the Scriptures, and we saw that as we went through the story. And if you just turn in your Bibles quickly, I want to look at 2 Corinthians 5 for just a few moments. See, when we look at a story like Asa, we understand that God's great heart for Asa was that Asa would be reconciled to God. That prophet who came to see him, Hanani, had at the thrust of his whole heart and his whole being, Asa, just turn your life over to God again. You saw the beginning of your life, how God helped you during, during these things when you trusted in Him. What has happened now that you think you are God, that you think you are the source, that you think you're the one in authority? And when, there is the, when the fall happens, we start to believe that we are God, that we're the boss, that we're in the role of source provider and in control. And, and as a result, those things get reversed. We see this in our society time and time again. But we're to understand that we that God is on a big rescue mission for us. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in fact, let's go to verse 11. Since then we know what is what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you, again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in us with rather what is in, what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, is it for the sake of, of God? If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For God, or Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live, notice this, for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The great heart of God is the understanding that more than anything, we all need reconciliation, not only with God, but with others, and even with ourselves. And, and, and this verse kind of lays it out for us, right? And the subjects that we're going to look at over the next number of weeks through the summer and if you're away on the holidays, we hope that they'll be up and we'll have some outlines there, things like that. But we are to be a people, when we know Christ, to pursue reconciliation. Not only with God, have a short account with God every day. That as the end of the day comes, or maybe during the day, we just spend some time asking God, God, where am I at with you? Because Asa didn't do that. Do we need to repent? Do we need to come clean with some things with God? Because reconciliation starts with pursuing, first of all, a right relationship with the Lord. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you trusted in Him? And as a result of trusting in God, is He changing your life? You know, last week as David gave the, the message, it was so clear and I'm, I'm so glad he was talking about this, that it's not just a transaction between us and God. No, the gospel is life transforming. We, we live differently. We don't live as the world does. Right? We don't try to solve problems without God. We, we use all of those kind of, kind of growth areas and, 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 and focuses, right? Those models there. Because they're in the scriptures and we have to use them all. Not to be so narrow on one or two, but to be discerning by the Spirit of God. Putting on the full armor of God. Realizing that we are all in a spiritual battle. And as a result of that, we need each other, we need the Word of God and the Spirit of God so that we can live a life that's so different from the world. 
And when we are pursuing a right relationship with God, that's when growth things start to happen. And then pursuing a right relationship with other people. See, I've met people who have great theology, but their family's all messed up. And they're not leading at home. They have an idea about the things of God, but they are not practicing the things of God in their family. And as a result of that, their children are confused, the people around them are confused, because at church they're one way, at home they're totally different, and they're even totally different in the workplace. But when the Spirit of God is truly at work in our life, there's consistency in our life. And one of the consistencies is that when we have wronged other people, we pursue reconcil reconciliation. We ask them to forgive us. But that means a relationship that's close with the Lord, that we are listening and obeying and listening to what God says. And part of that reconciliation that we often forget about. We want, we want heaven. We don't want to go to hell. We want heaven. We want salvation. But one of the marks of someone who truly knows Christ and has been transformed by Jesus Christ is that they are pursuing a pure life. They're pursuing righteousness and holiness in their life. I remember uh, there was a picture of when... And that's my wife, Gwen, down there, the worship leader in the last two years. Um, there's a picture of her and her sisters where one of them has their hands over their ears, right? One of them has their hands over their mouth. And one of them has their hands over their eyes. Which one are you? So do you know what that means? Right? See no evil. Hear no evil and speak no evil. See, there are some Christians that believe it is really cool to speak evil, to hear evil, and even see evil. That, well, you know, I need to be much like the world. The world doesn't need Christians like that. The world needs holy people who are making a difference no matter where they are. Their speech is different. What they watch is different. What they hear is different. What they do is different. Our world says, get rid of the sick. Give them a shot. Get them out of this world. No, no. Christians say, no. We care for the dying. We care for those who are hurting. Very different. We've seen some great examples of that recently. Pauline's grandmother I went to see Pauline and her grandmother one night at Secure House. And, uh, not Secure House. Yes, yeah, Secure House. I get a couple of the hospices mixed up. And as she was there, and family members were there, I've been to so many different people within our church through different things, and I've seen the care that they've given to relatives and family or dying. And the love that's shown. And those people know it. But our world says, no, no, get rid of people. That's not pursuing a pure life. That's not right. It's not righteousness. It's not holiness. And God says, we are to be different. Radically different. Now, holiness doesn't mean you're grumpy, okay, people? Okay? just want to convey that. Holiness doesn't mean grumpy or snitty or whatever. Those, those people think they're holy. They're not. Their attitudes are not Christ-like. And it's okay to laugh. Right? It's okay to have fun. It, it's, it, it's okay to bless, right? Right? Not kind of walk around like you just drank two big jars of pickle juice. Right? Because it's also pursuing the abundant life or the spiritual life. I'm going to talk about that. That will be one of our subjects for our girl. We are to be growing like Christ. We are to put on the mind of Christ. We are to be filled with the Spirit so that the, the fruit of the Spirit 
The Spirit-filled life is evident in our life so that we're growing. I'd like to put up the last picture today. There's Chloe now. Right? She's been growing. Okay? Not just eating us out of house and home right now. But she's training better. She's growing in her training and, and different things. She can sit. She can stay. She, uh, she, when I take her for a long walk, I let her off the leash in the bush and, and she goes. But there's one thing that she's taught me. And every time we go into the woods, I let her off. She starts biting her leash. She knows it's done. And I have a few treats in my pocket, right? Because okay. she runs. I let her off. She kind of lets me go on ahead and then she just comes by me. Like this. Right? And she's looking back at me. Fast me. And then there's some places in the trail. There's the main trail and then there's these trails off. Right? Up to somebody's house or to the apartment buildings or pit or whatever. Right? I go out early in the morning I have a great prayer time. I, and then I see her. She, she'll come to it. And she's looking at the trail down through here, right? And then she sees this other one. And she's looking at me. Then looking at the trail. And she's wondering, can I go here? Now she hasn't done it yet. Because when I come to this spot... I give her a little treat. And I bless her. And then we carry on. And then we come to the next one. It's like clockwork. Right? But it's like us in our life with God too. Right? God has this clear path. He wants us to run in. Yet we see the detours. And we think, I can handle that. Right? And we go against history. We go against the, the Word of God. We go against our better judgment even. It looks good going down this way. And then we find out that's not so good. And that little dog, who's now a bigger dog, who will be a bigger dog? I think she's part of the family too. <laughs> has taught me this. That God partners us, partners with us to grow and be healthy in every area. And that the Lord is looking around throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. And He sees us. And He sees us when we're coming to the path the path that He has for us, we know it's His path, but we see the detail. And there have been some times where I've walked down a little further down the path, and Chloe's still here making the decision. And I go, come on, Chloe. Come on. And she comes. And I reward her. See, that prophet who went to see Asa understood this concept. That God just wants to pour a blessing when we're following His path. Because when we're following His path, He wants to grow us. He wants us to experience His blessings in our life. Because the Word of God says He wants to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. I think this is the one of the biggest growth verses in the Bible. And you see it all the way through the Scriptures. God blesses those who are fully committed to Him. He will lead them through the hardest things of their life if they just trust Him. And He will do the same for us. But you've got to trust Him. And He will reward you. And He will bless you. And He will grow you. That's what this series is all about. Let's pray. Father, as we pray this morning, there might be some of us who kind of detoured and we paid a big price for it. 
And yet, Father, if we're still breathing and alive, you are the God who wants to reconcile with us if we want to reconcile with you. And you want to do things in our life that we can't explain, only you can do. So, Father, if we're trusting in a certain model, but not trusting in you, I, I just pray, Father, that you would help us to be vulnerable enough, transparent enough, to say, Lord, I've been choosing these other ways to solve my problems rather than trying to seek you. The healing that you want to bring, the direction you want to bring, the strength that you want to bring. And so, Father, help us to go your way no matter what. When the world is going on the Broadway that leads to destruction, may we be the people who are going God's way. It might be narrow, it might look scary, it might look dangerous, more dangerous than what's out there. But Father, we are going to be the people that will not shrink back, but we will move ahead by faith with you. So be our shepherd, be our leader, be the one who disciplines us to keep us back on the right trail with you. In Jesus' name.